of modification, and his eyes rose to the top of the page, and there was a fax imprint. Food and Drug Administration, 1990. They knew. They knew and kept silent about the fact that the earlier cases of this disease were from genetically modified bacteria from the same company. In fact, if you read the actual testimony before Congress by the FDA's representative describing, supposedly, the cause and ramifications of this epidemic, they never told Congress it was genetically modified. They never mentioned the word. They instead blamed the, the epidemic on health fraud schemes and got all L-tryptophan removed from the market. It's now only available by prescription. Now, it took a series of coincidences and good luck to, d to track the fact that this epidemic came from L-tryptophan. Remember, there was that signature. The eosinophil count was very high, a rare set of very serious symptoms, symptoms which came on soon after these individuals were taking the pill L-tryptophan. So there were three characteristics, acute, rare, and fast onset. Imagine if only one of these were not there. Let's say it took 10 years to develop this sickness. The L-tryptophan would still be on the market, right? Let's say it was mild symptoms, like frequent colds, or memory loss, or memory loss. <laughs> <laughs> It would still be on the market. Let's say it were common ailments like cancer or heart disease or lymphoma or diabetes or obesity. You think they would rush people together and say, find out the history? Find out what you're doing and someone else is doing? And since there's so many things that can contribute to these other problems, you think they'd be able to sort it out? It's doubtful. So what about the other thousands of products on the market that are created from genetically modified crops? or bacteria or fungus? Might they be creating a problem that we don't know about and are not looking for? We know that food-related illnesses in the United States doubled between 1994 and 2001, at a time when a lot of new genetically engineered products were being introduced. I read last week that someone was very concerned in Russia about genetically modified foods because in the last three years, allergies skyrocketed, as they have in the United States. An interesting, an interesting coincidence, when genetically modified soybeans were first introduced into the United Kingdom, soy allergies in that country skyrocketed by 50%. Now, we know that the genetically modified soy, according to Monsanto's own research, has an increase in an allergen called trypsin inhibitor. So it has an increased allergen. But no one has done the tests to see if there are more allergic reactions to those taking genetically modified soy versus those taking conventional soy. So what's different between the genetically modified soy and the conventional soy? Why would it have increased trypsin inhibitor? It's only supposed to have one added trait. The added trait to 80% of the soybeans grown in the United States is called herbicide resistance. You see, Monsanto found a bacteria growing in a dump site behind their factory that was resisting death by their herbicide called Roundup. And they said, this is a great thing. Let's put it in the food supply. So they found out what protein in the bacteria was causing this bacteria to survive. They found out which gene in the bacteria was creating that protein. They snipped it out. And typically, they, the way that you create a genetically modified product is you change the DNA, you change the genetic code, you add a few other things to it, you put it on a bunch of little microscopic BBs of gold, you put it in a gun, a gene gun, and you blast a 22, 22 caliber blast into a plate of cells and hope that some of your genes get in some of those DNA, cells' DNA. This is their precise method of insertion. And you don't know exactly where in the DNA it ends up. And the concept, the building foundation of genetically modified foods is that all you're doing is adding one trait, one gene to create one protein to create one trait, and everything else is fine. In reality, when you do that 
blasting, you can create all sorts of problems. There was a gene chip that monitored gene expression in the DNA at a time when the insertion occurred. Compared to prior to insertion, 5% of the host's genes were disrupted, meaning that they either increased, decreased, shut off entirely, or shut on entirely their production of protein. So if something is pumping out proteins at random that wasn't supposed to, what could that mean? This list will come up several times tonight. It could be allergenic, toxic, carcinogenic, anti-nutritional. If you shut down a gene, what could that mean? Some studies have found animal, laboratory animals have died, etc. We don't really know all the potential ramifications, but we do know that the most common result of genetic modification is surprises. Surprise side effects. When you genetically modify a bacteria to create L-tryptophan more economically, it means you produce more L-tryptophan in this fermentation broth. You also, they also, added genes to produce different enzymes. So all of a sudden you have a bunch of different enzymes and L-tryptophan together working out and doing some very complex interactions. One of the world's experts at biosynthesis of L-tryptophan said you can end up with, with creating new compounds that you weren't expecting. These new compounds can then interact with existing compounds to create yet new compounds. This could explain those six contaminants. Moreover, the actual L-tryptophan itself is toxic to the bacteria. So in high quantities, the bacteria may do something to modify the tryptophan or the environment to protect itself. So we have an incredible amount of opportunity for unpredicted side effects. And this is the process of genetic modification, and this is used to create enzymes and additives and cooking agents and aspartame, NutraSweet, the genetic modification of bacteria or fungus. That's the first category of genetically modified products. Now, the second category is milk products. Milk products from cows that have been injected with genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. It's interesting that in the process of approving genetically modified bovine growth hormone, a number of scientists spoke out at the FDA. And one, one talked about how the process was putting the public at risk, and he had a supervisory role in the evaluation of RBGH until he made that comment in public, and then he was stripped of responsibilities and sent to work at a trailer at an experimental farm on a different project. A division director who said that the industry had too much control over what the FDA was doing, he was forced out. A veterinarian who was asking for too many tests, it was slowing the approval process down, he was fired. The remaining whistleblowers decided to be anonymous. They wrote an anonymous letter to Congress and said that there was conflict of interest and fraud going on at the agency. They talked about Margaret Miller, who for Monsanto, created a bunch of experiments in RBGH, then moved to the FDA to evaluate her own research. She also, according to this letter, at random, changed the amount of allowable antibiotics in milk. In order to approve this injection, it was going to increase infections, it was going to increase the use of antibiotics, so she raised the level from one part per 100 million to one part per million, a 100-fold increase. When the Congress people eventually did an investigation, they also looked into Michael Taylor. Michael Taylor, just before becoming the number two man in the FDA in charge of policy, the man who decided that, cows, that milk from cows injected with RBGH does not have to be labeled, he was formerly attorney for Monsanto Corporation. Monsanto produces RBGH. He later became a high-ranking official in the USDA and later the vice president for Monsanto. And that's not unique. If we look into the current and previous administrations, there's a revolving door. In fact, one interesting comment, someone described the Monsanto Board of Directors as a virtual retirement home for former Clinton administrators. And in addition to seeing the kind of pressure that was put on the US scientists, 10 years later when Canada was evaluating RBGH, the same thing happened there. Six scientists testified before 
parliament there that they had been pressured and one was told that if you didn't approve r b g h